Okay, hi everyone, we are back. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our second biotechnology live stream. Um, you know, we had such a great reception to our first one that we just wanted to do it again. Um, my name is Danielle Snowflack. Um, I am the Senior Director of Education at Evotech. Um, and, you know, we've been working uh, over the past couple of weeks to um, develop this uh, training webinar, training live stream. Um, which is featuring one of our new kits. It's the Edvotech MyLab uh, kit, uh, which is going to cover simulating the COVID-19 antibody test. But first, um, if this is your first time joining us, just a little bit about Edvotech. Um, we are the biotechnology education company. We were founded over 30 years ago now um, with a focus on science education. We were founded by Dr. Jack Churchian, a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, now, the 80s were a super exciting time for biotechnology. Um, if you look back, you can see the innovations of genetic engineering to make insulin. Um, we can think about the development of the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which we'll talk about a little bit in this workshop. Um, or you can think about forensic science with DNA fingerprinting, um, where we could use the the letters in the DNA genome to, uh, you know, determine whether a person was in a particular location um, based on a blood sample they may have left behind. Um, and these were so exciting to scientists at the time, but little of this was being translated into the classroom. Um, and thus, Edbotech was born. Um, our focus is on working with educators to bring biotechnology into the classroom. Um, we work with educators all over the world to demystify science and to foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on learning. So the experiment we're gonna run today is a very topical experiment. Um, we are going to be talking about a, an ELISA, an antibody test for um, SARS-CoV-2, um, which is the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease, um, which we uh, are currently um, dealing with. Um, in all over the world. Um, this experiment is going to be a simulation of an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. The ELISA is a very sensitive technique that can detect the presence of specific molecules within a biological sample. Um, the kit we're using today is the Edvotech Custom Kit number 1219, a simulation of the COVID-19 antibody test. Um, so I just want to emphasize that this test that we're doing today is a simulation. There are no human samples involved. There are no live viruses involved. Um, this is a simulation of the ELISA test. Um, but it's a great demonstration because we can cover all of the same principles um, that we would do if we were actually performing this test, um, but we can perform it from home. Uh, no biosafety hazard suits necessary. Um, we will be using proper PPE, um, but you know, that's the, uh, we're not putting ourselves in, in any sort of danger. Um, we will be able to run this assay from start to finish in under 20 minutes. Um, while the experiment is running, we're actually going to talk about transmission and testing for coronavirus and the science behind why the testing works. So, um, this test, as I mentioned, is an ELISA. Um, we, since we can generate uh, antibodies to a lot of different molecules, the ELISA is a highly versatile test um, that can be adapted for many different uses. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, we'll definitely talk more about the science um, as we go through this workshop, but I just kind of want to give you a broad overview. Um, and so one place where the ELISA is commonly used is in allergen detection. So if you have an allergen to milk or peanut or egg, you need to become really careful about the foods that you're eating. Um, the manufacturers can use the ELISA test to determine whether or not there are, um, whether or not there are allergens present in the food. Um, ELISA tests are commonly used uh, for hormones. Um, one common application is a pregnancy test, um, drug tests, um, or in disease detection. So um, one thing is if you've ever had a rapid flu test, um, you have had an ELISA done on a biological sample from you. Um, so, the, and we're gonna focus on medical testing for this webinar. Uh, the ELISA can be used to test blood and other biological samples for the presence of 
uh, different antigens or antibody generators. Um, those are going to be our molecules that we're looking for. Um, and so if we're talking about the flu test, you're going to do the long nasopharyngeal swab. And that's where they take a long Q-tip essentially, stick it up your nose, um, and reach back to the back of your sinus cavity to take a sample from there. Um, the doctors are going to take that clinical test sample and um, using the ELISA determine whether there are flu, flu molecules present. Um, and much of this, and that's also going to be the way you're going to test for um, COVID-19, which we'll talk about later in this discuss in our discussion. Um, so there are two different kinds of ELISAs. Um, I always like to think of them, they're quantitative or qualitative. Um, and I like to think of the ELISA asking two questions. Uh, the qualitative ELISA is yes or no, and the quantitative ELISA is how much or how many. Um, and so the talking about the qualitative ELISA, qualitative ELISA um, again, that is a, 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 an assay for a question that you just need a simple answer to. Um, so I always like to use the pregnancy test as an example. Um, I'm a mom, I have two kids, I uh, have had a little bit of exposure to pregnancy tests. And the thing is, you're not a little bit pregnant. Um, so the pregnancy test is going to look for the presence of a, the hormone HCG in your urine. Um, and if you take it at the right time, um, it will give you a positive or negative result, um, suggesting whether or not you have that particular hormone in your body. Um, and that, bo that is an indicator of early pregnancy. Um, the quantitative ELISA asks the question of how much or how many. So um, this would be something where we need to know uh, a value of what is present, not just yes or no. And so one example of this is in food. Um, again, getting back to that allergen detection. So here I have a label that I have uh, found from some oat bran you found online. And if you are gluten-free, if you have a gluten allergy, if you have celiac disease, you need to be really careful about what you eat. And so what you can see is on this label, um, they say that they've been ELISA tested to less than three parts per million. So that's a really low amount um, of allergen present in that sample. Um, and if you look, it says this package contains no gluten, no dairy, no soy, no eggs, no peanuts, no tree nuts. Uh, they're testing for all of these um, basically to determine whether or not these common allergens are present. And oftentimes they can become present um, through manufacturing. Um, and so what we would do is we would take our, we would first take our allergen, which is going to be gluten in this case, um, and we would make a solution of known quantities and dilute it out over a large range um, so that we get something like this, what you see in the slide, the standard curve. Um, and the quality of lightness or darkness in each of those wells denotes how much allergen is present. So if we were looking at a sample in the middle, um, if we wanna say, let's say the inter intermediate value in the middle is our three parts per million. Um, and we wanna test that it's below three parts per million um, of gluten in our food product. Um, what we would do is create this standard curve, and then we would do the ELISA um, on the experimental sample, so our processed food. Now, if the color was darker than that three parts per million um, place, um, we wouldn't be able to use that oat bran and market it as gluten-free um, because we're above that value. Now, if we're below that value, it doesn't mean that the food is entirely gluten-free. It just means it's below um, what the, um, it's below what they signify as the lower limit of detection. Um, and so, um, you know, we are going to um, talk today um, about um, a qualitative ELISA, so a yes or no ELISA, um, which is going to be our COVID-19 ELISA. All right, so let me change over to my camera. All right, because we are gonna go through all of the different reagents that we are going to need for this ELISA. So first again, PPE, oh, you can't really see that that well. Um, these are my gloves. I am gonna wear gloves for this, um, for this live stream. Um, again, we're not working with live virus. We are not working with human samples, but it's always better to be careful. Um, and let's talk a little bit about um, what we are including. So um, I've cut the bag open already just so that um, I don't have to fumble with all the different samples. Um, but what you can see is we have our kit comes with all of the samples um, ready to go um, and they are in tubes that are labeled with what everything is so it's easy to get it home and start the experiment. 
Um, the first samples we need are our test samples. So let me grab them. So, uh oh, I have two of them that stuck together. All right, so here we have a negative control and we have our patient samples. Oops. And they might roll away on me. So, um, well, they're gonna roll away on me a little, but that's okay. Um, you can see that they are tubes. They're all very clearly marked. Um, and these test samples are going to be, we're first gonna talk about our test samples. Um, they are simulated, but for many medical tests, if you were having an ELISA done, um, they would use blood or urine or saliva from the patient. Um, the experimental samples we're going to test, we don't know how they're going to turn out, um, whether they'll be positive or negative at the end of the test. Okay, well, maybe you do if you're paying attention a few slides ago where I showed the picture of the experiment, um, but um, let's just forget that we showed that. Um, we, we are going to, for this kit, we're going to recommend that you create patient medical histories to go along with the patient samples. Um, factors that you'd want to include there are recent travel, current outbreak locations, the symptoms that the patient may have. Um, and one thing I would say is that, you know, we're still involved um, in this um, situation where researchers are learning more and more um, about the virus and its symptoms. Um, so what I would say is that since the information is subject to change, I would refer to the CDC website before you perform the experiment um, for the most up-to-date information and how you can um, and how you can really um, use this information, uh, how you can use the symptoms to create patient histories. Um, our control samples um, are just that they're samples that we know how they'll react in the assay. A positive control should give a positive result and a negative control a negative result. Now, if our control fails or if our assay doesn't give the correct results, I mean, this is going to represent a learning, a learning moment for us. Um, and good results are just as, bad results are just as important as good results. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge that science is messy and experiments don't always work the way we intend them to. Um, but really have your students analyze the results and explain what went wrong. Um, and because even experiments that don't work can teach us important lessons. So next, we're going to have our primary antibody that's going to be in this tube. Uh, the primary antibody recognizes and binds directly to the antigens in, in our patient sample that we're testing for. Um, so for our ELISA, we are looking for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that's going to cause, that causes COVID-19. Um, in many uh, ELISAs, you're going to need a buffer. This is generally used to dilute antibodies and wash the wells of your microtiter plate. Um, for this experiment, um, we actually don't include a buffer. Um, we are um, not including the buffer because we've already done the preparation for you. Um, we provided all the necessary reagents at the proper concentration, and we've also optimized the conditions so that we don't need to wash the wells. Um, we are going to perform this the experiment in a microtiter plate. Um, this is a microtiter plate. It is a clear plastic plate a thin piece of plastic with multiple little wells. Each well is gonna serve as a separate mini test tube of sorts. Um, while doing the experiment, each well is an individual reaction that's gonna be done in parallel with additional uh, reactions. Um, and I just wanna note that this, um, this presentation is going to be archived on our YouTube page. So if you do wanna to refer to it later, um, you're welcome to view it as many times as you want to, share it with your students. Um, you know, we want to make this a reference for you um, and a resource in your teaching. Um, finally, we need to get the samples into our regions, into our wells. There are a few ways we can do this. One is using a plastic transfer pipette. Um, that's what we're going to use today. Um, you can also use a micro pipette, which is a precision tool used to make measurements of uh, very small samples. Um, to simplify today's demonstration and to show that we can run this experiment without any special equipment, um, I'm going to use the transfer pipettes today. And you'll see we can still get excellent results without any special equipment. All right, so let's get started with the experiment. Um, all right, let me advance my slide. So first thing first, um, we want to label our plate and our pipettes. Um, now, with a little uh, movie magic, um, I have already taken care of that before. 
So we are going to label all of our pipettes um, with the reagent that they're going to be used with. Um, and then we are going to label. So you can see I have these labeled um, with what they're used for, substrate, control, antibodies. And then we are going to also have our microtiter plate, um, which I've also labeled with one, two, three, and four. Uh, using the appropriate transfer pipette, I am going to, let's see, I, using the appropriate transfer pipette, I am going to add our capture antibody. So that is the anti-human SARS-CoV-2 IgG IgM antibody. And I'll explain um, more about that um, as we go um, along the experiment, um, but I just wanna let you know what we're adding here. Um, and I'm gonna use my transfer pipette and add this antibody to each well, two drops. Um, and we wanna try and get that lower into the well um, so that it's sitting on the bottom. Um, yeah, it's a little difficult sometimes to uh, do this under the camera. So you'll see a couple of my samples um, are sticking to the sides of the well. So I'm just going to tap that down to make sure that I get all the samples down. Um, all right, there we go. Of course, I had to make the ch -ch -ch noise to go along with my um, tapping. Um, and so this antibody is going to look for, this is anti-human SARS-CoV-2 antibody. This antibody is gonna look for specific markers in our samples that suggest that a person has been infected by or recovering from COVID-19. Um, we are gonna be giving this a few minutes to incubate before moving on to the next step. So let's discuss um, what's going, let's discuss some of the science behind what we're doing. All right, so antibodies are, um, going to allow us to distinguish between not self and non self. Um, antibodies are also called immune immunoglobulins, which you have likely heard them called. Um, these specialized proteins are made by our immune system to differentiate between self and non self proteins or polysaccharides. Um, we're going to call these non self proteins and polysac polysaccharides antibody generators or antigens. Uh, each antibody is a Y-shaped molecule composed of four different polypeptide chains, two of the longer heavy chains, um, and two of the short light chains. The polypeptides are all linked together um, by disulfide bonds and hydrophobic hydrostatic interactions between the proteins. Now, if you were to compare the amino acid sequence of two antibodies, the vast majority of the sequence is exactly the same. However, the amino acid sequence of the antigen binding site, which is the little pocket at the end of, our, the, the, end of the short arms of our Y-shaped molecule, is gonna be variable, which allows each antibody to recognize a unique epitope or a particular location within an antigen. Since the sequence can be so variable, um, the antibodies in our body can recognize and attach to a lot of different molecules. Um, the antibodies tag our non-self proteins for attack by other parts of the immune system. Um, so are you guys doing puzzles while you're um, staying safer at home? Um, we certainly are. Um, and I can think of the antibody antigen connection like puzzle pieces. There are a lot of pieces that look similar, but they lock together when there's a match. Um, that's like our antibody connecting with our antigen and marking it for, um, for destruction by the immune system. So our antibodies are gonna mark our antigen, whether it's an invading bacteria or a virus or a cancer cell, um, and target it for destruction by the immune system. Because of their specificity, antibodies can be used to detect the presence of specific molecules, peptides, proteins, antigens, hormones, in a complex sample. Um, and you know we're talking about the ELISA today, but there's a lot of different applications um, of immunohistochemistry, so the um, immunochemistry, so the interactions between um, antibodies and their target antigens. <clears throat> so the immune system is going to produce antibodies to detect these antigens. Um, antibodies are produced when animals like rabbits, mice, guinea pigs, humans um, are introduced to an antigen. And so if we're generating antibodies in the lab, generally we are going to inject them into the animals. And since many different immune system cells within the animal are gonna produce antibodies in response to the antigen's introduction, the blood serum is gonna contain a mixture of antibodies that vary in their ability to bind to the antigen. Um, this mixture of antibodies is called a polyclonal antibody, and you can see it illustrated here in this picture. Um, 
if we isolate and culture individual immune cells from our animals, when we create a monoclonal antibody that's only going to recognize a single epitope or a single location um, on our protein. Um, so I always think about our antigen as being a water bottle. Um, and if we were together uh, at a workshop somewhere, I would hold up a water bottle and I would demonstrate this. Um, but here is a stock photo instead of a person holding a water bottle. Um, and so the hand in this picture is holding the bottom corner of our water bottle. And we can think of that picture as, you know, one antibody recognizing a single epitope. The hand represents the antibody um, and it's recognizing the bottom of that water bottle and binding on. That's kind of representative of what a monoclonal antibody would be. So one antibody recognizing one location um, and it's single. Now, if I had a second hand and I was holding the cap of the water bottle simultaneously, um, we'd be recognizing two different sites on the water bottle, that bottom corner and that cap. Um, that's gonna be what I think of as a monoclonal antibody. So both antibodies are present, both hands are present, um, and they are binding with different parts of the same molecule. Now, one type of antibody isn't necessarily better or worse than another. Um, both types can be used in a wide array of experiments from the ELISA, which we're doing today, to staining cells or doing a Western blot. The most important thing is when developing an assay to take the time and care to select the best antibody for your application. Uh, to be used in the laboratory, antibodies must have specific, robust, and reproducible interactions with the antigen. Antibodies that have a high affinity for nonspecific antigens will have unwanted cross-reactions that result in high background. In contrast, an antibody with a weak affinity may not be sensitive enough to, for the antigen detection. Um, these antibodies would produce results with a high false positive or high false negative result. Okay, so next thing we are going to move on to the next step. So we are going to add our patient samples. Um, so... Let me put my little, switch out my little card so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, and we will start with our positive control sample. So let me find that positive control. So um, in this, at this point, um, you know, we want to be really careful um, not to cross contaminate samples. So we want to make sure to add our positive control. Oh, I'm already starting off on a bad foot. I grabbed our positive control when I'm supposed to be adding a negative control. So this is important, um, you know, again, to emphasize, you know, science is messy. Sometimes uh, a bad result comes just from a simple mistake like I almost made. Um, so um, it's a good thing I checked um, that I was using the correct pipette. So first I'm gonna take our negative control and I'm gonna put two drops in each of these wells. Now, had I used the wrong control in the, in the first well, um, that would have represented a teaching moment. Um, you know, again, we don't want to cross-contaminate our samples, um, but if the experiment didn't work out as we thought it should, um, that would represent a teaching moment, another time to talk about experimental error. Um, and you know how easy it is to make mistakes when we're doing science. Um, you know, and I think that's part of the reason why, you know, we want to make sure our experiments are re robust and reproducible. Um, it's important for scientific studies to use peer review or have collaborators double check um, that your, um, your experiments work um, so that your results are authentic and not artifacts. Um, and, you know, um, this would be, you know, this again is a perfect, um, time for us to um, have our students really think critically and write critically um, about the potential places where um, things can go wrong. Um, and again, you know, um, it's a big part of not only science learning, but it also brings in those critical core, um, course, um, core concepts, um, core curriculum um, skills of reading, writing, and, and comprehension. And you can have your students write a persuasive essay um, perhaps about why their experiment went well or it didn't go well. All right, so now I have added my, um, I've added our um, patient samples and hopefully I did them correctly while talking. Um, and so um, we're gonna let that incubate again um, and we will talk more um, about um, what's going on in our, uh, in our wells.
So we're gonna dive into the mechanics behind the ELISA. Um, so there are many protocols for the ELISA, um, but they all rely on using antibodies to detect the presence of antigens in experimental samples, and they all follow the same basic principles. Um, first, we add our sample where it sticks to the plastic walls of our microtiter plate through hydrophobic and electrostatic interactions. So the chemical properties of the protein itself um, are going to help it stick to the walls of the, um, the, walls of the microtiter plate. Um, after washing away any excess sample, um, the wells are going to be blocked with a protein-containing buffer to present different nonspecific interactions. Now, this is important because an antibody is a protein too. Um, and so an antibody can stick to the walls of our microtiter plates. So this would be a place where we would be able, we would get false um, positive results because even if our antigen wasn't present, um, the antibody would stick and it would help, it would form this complex um, in our wells. Um, so for the ELISA we're performing today, we have simplified, simplified things um, so that we don't need the blocking step. Um, yeah, after, um, after blocking, we would add the primary antibody to the wells. Um, if the antigen is present, the antibody is going to bind through electrostatic interactions to that epitope that it recognizes. Excess antibody is going to be washed out of the wells. Um, the next thing we would do is we would add our secondary antibody. So we're forming an antibody antigen complex in our plate. Um, if the antibody antigen has formed in the well, because we have the antigen present, which is then bound to this primary antibody, which is then recognized by the secondary antibody, um, it will remain in the well after the wells are washed. The secondary antibody is covalently linked to an enzyme that's going to allow us to detect the antibody antigen complex. Um, then there are a couple ways that we can do this. So there are a couple common enzymes that are linked to antibodies. One is horseradish peroxidase, another one is alkaline phosphatase. Um, and these are linked covalently. So, um, you know, we're not relying on simple electrostatic interactions to keep them together. Um, and these molecules can um, break down colorless substrates. Um, and, you know, so horseradish peroxidase, um, alkaline phosphatase, they're going to, we're going to add these clear substrate molecules. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to break down these mo molecules um, and emit either color, which is a chromogenic detection, or light, which is fluorogenic. Um, and this is going to allow us to determine which wells we have created this antibody antigen complex in. Now, since most antibodies have a high catalytic activity, uh, meaning they can really quickly turn over the substrate, this assay is going to allow us to quickly detect even the smallest amount of body. And just remember, enzymes can continually process substrate molecules. So as we um, break down one substrate molecule, it leaves the enzyme's active site, and a new molecule can come in and be broken down. And then that, then that product is additive. And so we're continually making more color or more light, um, which allows us to detect incredibly low amounts of a specific um, antibody. So one variation of the ELISA is the sandwich ELISA, in which two separate antibodies are used to detect antigens. Um, so I see a question. Um, you're confused about the washing. So in general, in the lab, you would wash um, between steps to remove any excess, um, excess antibody, excess reagent um, from the wells. Um, for this ELISA, we have simplified it um, since it's an at-home ELISA and you know, we wanted to try and eliminate as much of the preparation as possible. So we have optimized this so that we don't need to wash between, between our, uh, the addition of our antibodies and our antigens. Um, so everything has been um, added already in different steps so that we don't have to worry about it. Uh, and this is the, the, in the simulation of the COVID-19 ELISA. Um, so again, in this um, workshop, we are talking about um, a sandwich ELISA, um, which is going to use two separate antibodies to detect the antigen. One antibody that is bound to the plate, which captures the antigen, and one that is used to detect it. So first, we add the capture antibody to the wells of our transparent microtator plate. And that's the antibody that we added this time, our anti-SARS-CoV antibody. Um, the antibody, again, since it's a protein, is going to nonspecifically adhere to the plastic through hydrophobic and electrostatic interactions. Follow the blocking step. The patient samples are added to the wells. The bound antibody recognizes the antigens and non-covalently bonds to um, that antigen. And so you can see that in our illustration here, um, the green 
antigen can bind to our antibody where the other shapes are not able to bind because they're just not, they just don't have the right conformation, the, the right structure, the right chemical and, and um, biological structure. Um, following the blocking step, the patient samples are added. Um, then we are going to wash and add the purified detection antibody um, and give it some time to incubate and to bind with antigen. Um, this detection antibody um, not only recognizes our um, antigen, um, it is also going to be covalently linked to a detection um, and enzyme so that we can use it as a detection antibody. Um, as with the other, the other assay, the indirect ELISA, um, we add our substrate, we allow things to turn over, um, and then we go, we allow things to turn over, and then we can detect um, based on um, which wells have formed the complex. And so from the research I've done, um, this is the protocol used for most COVID ELISAs, um, but that can possibly change in the future. Um, so to recap, we talked about two different ELISA protocols. Um, we talked about the indirect ELISA and the sandwich ELISA. Um, both of these techniques are used to identify antigens in biological samples, um, and they largely follow the same principles um, of interactions between antibodies and antigens. Um, however, the way we build the antigen-antibody complexes are different. Um, so let's think about our antigens, uh, our ELISAs, as delicious Instagrammable foods. Um, so the indirect ELISA is kind of like an ice cream cone. The cone is our antigen, which is going to bind to the microtiter plate. Each scoop of ice cream is an antibody in our complex. The first scoop is our primary antibody, which binds to our pri which binds to our antigen, which is the cone. Um, and the second is our enzyme-linked secondary antibody, which recognizes our primary antibody and binds. So we're essentially building a complex on top of our antigen. The sandwich ELISA is like, well, a sandwich. Um, the cone is our, um, the antibodies are our bread, um, and the antigen is going to be our filling. Our capture antibodies and our detection antibody both interact with the antigen present in our samples. Okay, so let's get back to our ELISA. Um, we are going to end our, add our enzyme-linked detection antibody to each of the wells in this plate. Um, once the antibody is added, we are going to incubate again to allow our complex to form. Um, and then we are going to talk a little bit about the coronavirus. All right, so double checking. I have the right pipette. I have the correct sample. And I am going to start adding. Oh, I, I have to update my little card. Uh oh, where did it go? Um, oh, well. I had a little card that said, oh no, here it is, detection antibody. All right. So we are going to add this to each well. And so while we're adding this, this is going to, remember we're doing the sandwich ELISA. So we are, this antibody is going to um, identify the presence of um, the antibodies in the patient sample. Um, and bind. And this antibody, again, is linked to the, um, it has an enzyme linked to it, which allows us to detect once we add the substrate. Okay, so let's talk about the virus itself. Um, so this is the anatomy of a coronavirus. This is a picture of a coronavirus. Um, and viruses are simple infectious particles that can't replicate independently. They are dependent on cellular machinery within their specific host. Um, because viruses carry genetic material, reproduce and evolve, but rely entirely on a host organism for their basic biological functions, um, they're not technically considered to be alive, depending on who you talk to. Um, they're kind of on the border of biology and on chemistry. Um, and so um, they're kind of on the um, interface of biology and chemistry. Um, and so they're super interesting particles to study. Um, there's a whole field of study of virology um, that looks at uh, viruses and how they are going to, um, and how they're, they interact with humans and their hosts. Um, the term coronavirus actually refers to an entire family of viruses. Uh, coronaviruses have a single-stranded RNA genome that's wrapped in a helical capsid. Um, a membrane that is derived from the host cells surrounds the capsid. Um, the capsid and the membrane are gonna protect the RNA genome from the external environment. Um, the envelope is studded with proteins that help the virus to infect cells. They interact with receptors on the surface of the cells in our respiratory system. Um, this allows them to invade the cells where they take over the cell's machinery to reproduce. 
So here, oh, ah, come on, advance. Um, here is an image of coronavirus collected using electron microscopy, um, which lets us visualize objects that are mere nanometers in width. And I just think this, this is a false color image. It would generally be black and white, um, but I found this um, image from the CDC Public Health um, Library um, where they have a lot of amazing uh, images collected by scientists of the CDC and other medical and other um, government agencies. Um, and it's false colored. So the blue is the background and the yellow and red are the coronavirus and it's um, envelope and it's a uh, spike proteins. Um, and so we can see the membrane envelope in this image and the envelope proteins that are studying out from the membrane um, very clearly in this image. Um, and the envelope creates this hazy halo around the virus particle when we look at it using electron microscopy. And that's actually where the name for coronavirus came from. Scientists describe these viruses with the Latin word corona, which means crown or halo. Now, this might be the time, first time you're hearing about coronaviruses, but they're not rare. Um, to date, there are seven different strains of coronavirus that cause, um, in fact, cause disease in humans. Um, there are four strains of virus that circulate regularly year by year um, and that are responsible for between 15 and 30 percent of all common cold cases depending on the year. The symptoms of this, of this virus are generally mild and include fever and sore throat. Um, however, um, there are times when a new agent is going to emerge um, because these viruses can infect mammals and birds. You know, there might be a reservoir or a place where the virus is living in nature where it hasn't infected humans. And, um, you know, there are multiple different ways that the virus can start to infect humans, um, both by the destruction of um, an animal's ecosystem, um, by humans uh, moving into it. Um, in many cases, um, you know, it can be um, found in food supply. Um, but, you know, they, they're there are ways for the virus to move between humans and animals. And sometimes a novel strain emerges that is going to cause severe respiratory distress. Um, we've seen two um, in the past, you know, 20, 30 years or so um, with SARS uh, in 2003 and MERS in 2012. Um, now this disease, um, COVID-19, first um, emerged in the winter of 2019. Um, and is traced back to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which we're going to discuss in depth. So just two important definitions. Um, I don't know that these are discussed enough, um, especially in media, um, but I always like to clarify what I'm talking about um, because um, we, we, have, we hear it called SARS-CoV-2, we, we hear it called COVID-19. Um, what's the difference? What do these mean? Um, so SARS-CoV-2 um, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 and that's the name of the virus that is responsible for the current pandemic. Um, COVID-19 is the disease itself. Um, and so this disease is characterized by symptoms including cough, fever, shortness of breath. Um, in severe cases, patients may have pneumonia, pneumonia, respiratory distress, or kidney failure. Um, and the image on this slide um, talks about a few more of the, um, a few of the, the symptoms that are common, uncommon, and in severe disease. Um, sadly, um, in many patients, now 100,000 or more, um, this infection can be fatal. Um, in general, treatment for COVID-19 includes rests, fluids, and over-the-counter uh, cold medications. Um, researchers are currently developing bat vaccines um, and antiviral medications to combat infection. And so you'll hear a lot about them in the news. Um, many are undergoing clinical trials right now. Um, and I know we're all anxiously awaiting the results to see um, you know, what is being developed. Um, according to the World Health Organization, COVID-19 spread worldwide in a very short period of time. Um, public health officials continue to work on strategies to infect, in, to identify infected in, individuals and to prevent further spread of the virus. So luckily, um, with proper precautions, we can prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 spread person to person through liquid droplet, droplets that come out when you cough or sneeze. And these are the infamous respiratory droplets you might hear about um, in the news. Um, luckily, um, it's easy to kill SARS-CoV-2. Um, it is a coronavirus. It's a membrane um, bound virus. And these are easily to kill um, with soap, hand sanitizer or other disinfectants. Um, and so you'll always see emphasized hand washing 
super important um, because soap can deactivate the virus. So 20 seconds of hand washing is actually more effective than hand sanitizers. Now, touching your face with contaminated hands can introduce a virus to your mucous membranes. Um, so it's important to keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth. Now, we can wear cloth masks like the one we see in this picture to cover the mouth and nose. Now, it's important to note that this is not going to protect you from breathing in the virus necessarily. Because um, remember, these virus particles are mere nanometers um, in diameter. Um, however, what it can do is capture the respiratory droplets that are leaving our mouth. And those respiratory droplets are pretty big. So think about someone when you sneeze or when you cough. Um, the droplets go into the air and they can spread six to ten feet um, in distance um, and so this mask will help contain them um, but it's important to wash the mask regularly in hot water dry it in a dryer um, to prevent the mask from then becoming um, a potential vector for disease um, we can also take actions like social distancing while the virus is spreading um, and that it's going to reduce the likelihood of infecting those around us um, if we were to sneeze or cough the most important thing is that you, if you are exhibiting symptoms of of the COVID nineteen, please reach out to your doctor or your local health professional, your local public health officials. There's a lot of information on the internet about this pandemic, um, some of it which is intentionally misleading. Um, the best source of information will come from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or from the World Health Organization, or from your doctor. So if you have severe symptoms for COVID-19, you may be tested for the virus. Um, there are two diagnostic assays that are used to confirm um, COVID-19 infection. Reverse transcriptase PCR or RT-PCR um, and the enzyme in the ELISA, which is what we're talking about today, an immunoassay. Um, RT-PCR is going to test for the presence of the viral genome, which is signifying an active infection. Um, that means that the virus is in your cells and it's um, copying its genome and it's spreading from cell to cell and it can also be actively spread um, through your respiratory droplets. Now a positive test does not mean that a patient is going to become seriously ill. Um, one thing that we've seen with this virus is that there can be asymptomatic carriers um, and there also are people who have mild symptoms. Uh, however, these diagnoses are important as they allow epidemiologists to trace the spread of COVID-19. RT-PCR is currently in use. Um, by public health laboratories around the world to act, identify an active um, infection. Uh, once the patient has recovered, um, the viral genome can no longer be detected in the body, which would render the RT-PCR test ineffective. Immuno immunological tests like the ELISA have been uh, developed to identify the presence of antibodies to COVID-19 in patients, signifying that a person had been previously infected. And so that's the kind of test we're performing today. Uh, most ELISAs for SARS-CoV-2 identify two different antibodies in patient samples, um, IgM and IgB. Uh, the IgM antibody serves as the first line of defense against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. These are very large antibodies that are able to bind pathogens and label them for inactivation by the immune system. As the body adapts to create a long-term immunity to the virus, IgG antibodies are going to be produced in the plasma, plasma B cells. These antibodies are an important part of the adaptive immune system. Um, and the presence of high level of this antibody signifies late stages of infection. Um, by using this assay, um, healthcare professionals and researchers will be able to better calculate the number of individuals affected by COVID-19 who may not have been tested while ill. However, since the body takes several days to produce these antibodies, this allies it cannot detect infected people before clinical symptoms arise. And so that's a caveat of this test. Um, so now we are going to add our substrate um, and hopefully, um, while I was talking, I didn't make any mistakes in adding my samples to the different wells. Um, oh, let me change out my card just so you can see what I'm adding. All right, so here we're going. Remember, this is our negative control. Here is our positive control. Um, and you can see a very quick color change. Uh, in any samples where the virus is present, where the antibodies to the virus are present. Um, so again, this is a color metric assay. Um, this is um, an assay that we can um, detect the color change using the, by the naked eye. Um, so a negative sample is clear and a positive sample is pink. Um, so in this simulated medical test, 
We use the ELISA to detect the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in a patient's um, blood sample. Um, we can see, luckily, um, I caught that mistake when I was um, uh, starting to um, dispense my sample. Um, and we can see that our negative and positive controls change color appropriately. Our positive control in the second, um, the second um, row, they're pink, and the negative control in the first row are clear. In patients that have been infected with the virus, the ELISA will detect the IgG and IgM antibodies and a color change reaction will be seen. Um, and that's gonna be our patient number one who was in uh, row number three. Uh, we can see those two samples have turned pink. Um, in contrast, a patient who was not infected with SARS-CoV-2 will not have the antibodies and there will be no color change in that, in that instance. So looking at this plate, just to summarize, um, patient one has COVID antibodies in their blood and patient two does not. All right, so um, we are at the end of our experiment. Um, we've covered a lot of information over the course of this experiment. Um, we talked about SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus, which is responsible for the worldwide pandemic of respiratory infection. And I know this is a little scary, even to those of us who have seen um, other outbreaks um, and understand the science behind viral infection. Um, and the ways that we can prevent the spread of virus, uh, spread of disease. Um, but that kind of makes this the perfect time to teach your students about virology, epidemiology, and medical testing in the context of current events. Um, your students will have likely seen the same news reports that you have and may be curious to learn more about, um, to learn more about the disease and how we can um, handle it. Um, it'll also help combat misinformation um, that can spread like wildfire in the days of the internet. Um, there are a lot of um, different um, conspiracy theories that are going around. Um, and, you know, it's important to have the knowledge to be able to think through what's going on um, in order to combat a lot of this information. And so we also talked about the ELISA, the principles of the ELISA, um, how it uses um, antibody antigen connect, um, connect complexes to detect um, different um, com different antigens or disease-causing agents in a patient sample. Um, this is a powerful and versatile biotechnology technique that can be applied to many different diagnostic scenarios. So today we talked about disease detection, um, but you know we have simulations. Uh, we have not simulations. We have tests where you can lo actually look for the presence of milk antibody milk antigens um, in food samples, and so. Um, there's a lot of applications for the ELISA in your, um, in your teaching. Um, this test is fairly simple. And this particular ELISA, this COVID ELISA, um, which is a simulation, again, there are no human samples involved and no viral samples involved, so it's completely safe to do anywhere you might want to um, do it. Um, you know, it, it is very simple to do. Um, and you can do it at home, but you can also do it in your lab um, when, the, when schools are back in session. Um, and it's just a powerful technique that can be used um, for many different applications. All right, so um, we are at the end of my prepared information. Um, so this is Edvotech. So to request the presentation, um, you can follow the link on this slide. Um, and let me pull it up as well. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, I'm at the point where I'm sure many of you um, teachers can empathize. I'm at the, the point of my lecture where um, I have dry throat and I need a drink of water. So I'm going to remove my gloves really quickly and take a sip of water. Um, and so you can um, go to this link. Um, oh, I, I brought open the wrong file with the link. Um, let me get that open. Um, so, um, and this link will, um, if you um, fill out this link, complete the link, um, I will email you when the presentation is available um, and when I get the presentation up online. Um, it'll take a little while because we'll have to process this video, um, but please complete this form and I will contact you in a few days with the information. Um, this is Edvotech. Um, for, we are very active on social media. Um, YouTube is one of our avenues. Um, we're also on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, you can contact us that way for questions or concerns, and you can also email us um, at info at edvotech.com. Um, we're still all working from home to make sure that, um, you know, our teachers and our educators can get what they need. Um, and with that, um, I have time for some questions if there are any. Um, 
about this um, test, about the um, coronavirus, about the ELISA. Um, you know, this is a fun experiment that can be done um, at home. Um, if you're distance, if you're teaching um, distance, um, if you are um, happen to uh, to happen to homeschool and you want your um, your children to learn more about it, um, and even um, you know you can do this in your lab once classes are back in session. Um, so um, I just while we have while I'm waiting for a couple questions to come in. Um, I figure I should mention that this is part of our Edvotech My Lab series, um, and we're going to put a link to that in the chat. Um, the Edvotech My Lab um, is our series um, of experiments that um, we are optimizing for at home learning. And so we do have this ELISA, which is one of them. Um, we also have um, experiments for DNA extraction, for um, testing different surfaces in your home for bacteria. Um, and we're constantly looking for um, different, um, different tests, different um, experiments that we can add for your at-home learning. Um, so if you do fill out that form, um, you can comment on it. And if there is an experiment you're looking for, um, be sure to put it in that form. Um, otherwise, you can always email us at info or at edvotech.com or tweet to us at edvotech. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways for us to, um, to interact with you, to help you in your, in your teaching and help you prepare. So, um, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, hopefully that means I did a good job explaining and I didn't just confuse everybody. Um, but again, we are always open for questions. Please get in touch with us. Um, and we will, we look forward to helping you, um, helping you implement these experiments um, in your classroom. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, we will be, again, um, I mentioned it earlier, but we will be archiving this presentation on our YouTube page. We'll put the slides up um, on our website as well so that you can download them and use them as a reference. Um, and just thank you so much um, for your time um, and stay safe, everybody. Have a wonderful day and, and we'll see you again in another live stream. Thank you.